All right, here we go. Hello, everybody. Ted Huntington here with another author interview sponsored by Women's Rights Publishing and Author Services. Today, I'm chatting with the internationally acclaimed Anne De Silva. Uh, please like and follow our videos on YouTube and support these fantastic interviews by becoming a Patreon patron. Who is Anne De Silva? Anne De Silva hails from the city that never sleeps. No, not Las Vegas, Mumbai. She has spent over two decades in the corporate world in senior management roles across the globe. Anne is a, a humanitarian, passionate about her initiative, India Heart, which empowers the women of India. So she's perfect for an interview sponsored by Women's Rights Publishing. Anne's first published work, Sand and Sea, Footprints in the Sand, was released in 2019. Her second book from the Sand and Sea trilogy is titled Child of Two Worlds. Anne relocated to Turkey and now lives in Istanbul. And I will post links to Anne's work underneath the video. Please welcome Anne De Silva. Hi, Ted. Thank you so much for having me. I'm like absolutely excited and delighted to talk to you and to be a part of your show. Well, I'm delighted that you're here. Now let's let's start by talking about your native country, India. It's from what I've seen, an absolute hotbed for writers, uh, right? Uh, how do you think that came about and, and what sparked this surge in Indian authors? So I think um, Indian people are very open-minded people. They're very emotional people. And if you watched a Bollywood film, you'd understand why I say emotional people. There is a huge connect with family. There's a huge connect with your roots. There's a huge connect with what we call um, guests, which is Atitu Deva Bhava, means the guest is God. And that's why India was also ruled by many, many countries because it was so open to them as guests first and then later got ruled by them. But India has this beauty of imbibing cultures of other people, you know. And that's what I've also used in my book to talk about the Turkish presence and the rule of Turkey in India for two centuries. But India as a country is full of creativity. You know, we have people who love the arts. We have, you know, artists in singing. So we have a lot of singing shows, dancing shows, budding writers. There's a poet in every family. And these things are encouraged. So if you'd ask me a normal Sunday evening with family, it has to be with songs, old songs from grandmother's days, all the way to the hip hop that's happening in our times, you know. So I think as a country, one, we are also the one of the largest population and we also have the largest number of young people. So a lot of young minds today are choosing alternate careers for themselves. They're wanting to pursue the arts. They're not really looking at a full-time corporate life. They are looking at it, as you would say, out of the box and being a bit adventurous. And, you know, so that's the beauty of India. Uh, India is a place of um, diversity. India is a place of colors. So wherever you have diversity and colors, you have creativity. Uh, I'm also really impressed with the, the grasp of the English language and the fact that so many Indian authors, it's like English is the primary language. How does that happen? So that's something we have to be grateful to our government. About 20, 25 years ago, the medium of instruction in schools was the first language was English. So you were taught English at a very young age, even if your mother tongue was one of the other languages of the states. You know, so we have many states in India and each state has its own language. But when the medium of education is English, then everyone learns it at a very young age. And therefore you get a good command of it, both written, written English and spoken English. And, you know, so that gives you an advantage, you know, as uh, puts you ahead of the others from other countries. Like just to give you an example, in Turkey, more than 70% of people only speak Turkish. It's only the locations that are into tourism and the people from the hospitality industry or the people who've traveled abroad or, or you know, gone to international schools that speak English. But if you as a foreigner come to India, even the tuk-tuk drivers or the autom uh, auto rickshaw drivers are going to answer you back in English. So that's something I think we owe as a big gratitude to our government to think ahead and you know, include that in the education system. 
Well, that's interesting. Educational for me, certainly. <laughs> so do you try to write for a global audience, you know, born and raised in India, and now you're in Turkey, you, you are a global person, or do you just try to write a good story and hope that it appeals to readers globally? Uh, so I wanted to create a niche for myself. You know, there are so many wonderful creative people there. And I believe that every human being is a story himself or herself. You know, it's just another it's just another part, whether you get the courage to narrate that story or you don't. You know, so everyone's a story. So you need to create a niche for yourself. You know, and having been in the corporate world for so long, I did about eight years in travel. And so I've watched travel shows which talk about cuisines or I've watched, you know, travel shows which take you to various locations and show you all the touristy spots. And I felt to myself that I love tourism, firstly, because I'm an avid traveler. I really love it. That's my personal preference. So why not be like a tourist writer? You know, take two countries and talk about the essence of the country the essence of the land, which, which, were the, which were the rulers that ruled these countries? How did they imbibe you know, the different uh, flavors of their rulers into their cuisines and so on and so forth and build a story that even if a person never travels to India or never travels to Turkey, through my book, they can actually experience various cities, both from a spiritual angle, you know, a poetic angle, as well as from the story point of view. So it's integrated with the story. That's great. So your readers can travel to these locations. I love that. Yes, I want them to. I want them to, through words, to travel to various places. That, that, that's the goal. When I was researching your work, uh, one of the things that really stuck out to me are your audio poems. They're really interesting and they're a, a somewhat unique way to present your poetry. Talk about those, your audio poems. No, so I always feel that the most difficult uh, thing is poetry versus prose, because you can spend um, two chapters to explain something, but when you have to make it concise and bring in rhythm and give it some, you know, dance and lyrics into it, it's got to be a poetry. And that was something that came very easy to me as a child. So, you know, when people looked at me and said, oh, poetry, that's easy. And you must be kidding me. And I'm like, really, I just, it just comes to my mind and I write it. And I felt that rather than people just having to, you know, read it through a book or through my novel, because my novel has poetry and prose in the middle of the chapters, the characters are communicating through a poem or it's playing in their mind. You know, I've just integrated poetry into my book because I love poetry so much. I wanted to read poems of mine and put them on my website, put them on different social platforms where people can, you know, just click the switch button on, the play button on, and listen to the whole feeling, listen to the whole poem. I think that's a more beautiful way of, uh, you know, putting a poem out there in the universe. M multimedia presentation, it really is fantastic. And, and, and again, going back to your website, it's really well done. I encourage viewers of this interview to go and check out your site. As I said, I'm gonna post links to it. It's, it's well-designed, it's highly functional. Uh, you have a section on readers where you post pictures of readers with your books. I, and I think that's brilliant. So are you a website design professional? Explain how that website has evolved. <laughs> So I'm just a creative woman, you know, I wake up with ideas and then I just don't leave them as ideas. I execute them. And then I go out and find people who are great at their jobs. And then we do these many so-called conference calls via Zoom, discuss the idea, develop the idea and allow people to collaborate with their talent, you know. And so this website is a product of the collaboration of talent of a lot of designers and, you know, also my manager who manages the website for me and, you know, she updates the content. And I feel if I'm successful, it is because people have read my book. Otherwise, I would be just another 400 pages in some shelf in, in some store, which has a name called And the Silva's Child of Two Worlds. So I feel I owe this to my readers. I feel very connected to them. I feel what, what makes me most happy is that they write to me via my email about a lot of questions that they experience, emotions they experience with the book. And that's very touching. 
because you know when someone shares a part of their life of course i can't put it on a social platform because that is something personal that they share why they connected with that story whether it's a grief journey or it is something to do with parting of two lovers or finding their soulmate in the end i feel those are the most the most magical part of being an author you feel that your book has connected with people and people are reaching out and sharing it with you all right, let's get into your book. So Footprints in the Sand. Talk about that book and how that came to life. So I, I used to, um, firstly, let me just break it down into two parts. Firstly, being Indian, we're a very old culture, you know, so past life regression, you know, uh, reincarnation, astrology, astronomy is a part of an everyday Indian's life. <laughs> you would never shock an Indian if you say that you went for past life regression or you have reincarnated as this person so you adopted this child. An Indian can relate to that instantly. So I come from a very old culture and there's a lot of beauty there. So when I was writing this whole concept of this trilogy, it was about three points in my mind. One, the purpose of love. You know, the purpose of love, the connection of soulmates and their purpose. Love today is the most abused word, you know. People use it very frivolously. I love you and whatever the reason or condition attached is something else. But true love always has a higher calling. True love brings the best out of you and the best out of the other person. And then like, you know, um, a well-grown tree, it spills over for the benefits for society as well. So that was my purpose to write about soulmates and true love first. That, and also to write about the stigmas in society which women face. So my first book, Child of Two Worlds, deals with uh, divorced women. Divorced women having a life again, finding true love, you know, going through that traumatic journey of breakup and heartache and, and grief and everything that they've struggled with to have that ray of hope that tomorrow holds magic for you. So that was the first book. And it took me from, from India to Turkey because I wanted the, the audience to experience something which is called past life regression. And so I've gone through it myself. You know, they put you in hypnosis and then, you know, you, you see yourself at different places, locations. You could have been somebody else in your earlier life and it helps you understand yourself better today. It's an alternative therapy. It's not something that the doctors will say is 100% uh, you know, certified by uh, the medical practitioners, but yes, alternate therapies work for whoever needs it. You know, like you could go to an angel reader or you could go to an alter, you know, a hypnosis therapist and they could help you with your phobias. They could help you with certain answers, which your everyday life and everyday physicians and psychiatrists may not help you. So I wanted to tap on that. And so therefore in, in the past life regression is the Turkish connection which the woman in the present time does not understand that. And so her journey to find out, find those answers and the journey to find her soulmate. So the first book is all about uh, women. It's the stigmas in society and the purpose of true love. And the second book, I was very touched when I moved to Turkey to learn about the Syrian refugees. You know, when the Syrian war happened, you know, millions of people were displaced and 5 million refugees were taken in in Turkey under a protective custody, you know, so they could live here temporarily till they were, you know, relocated or they've got jobs and, you know, they could get a better life for themselves. So the second book, Child of Two Worlds, is basically the soul child and, you know, her birth in this life to these two people who are soulmates. So it's, I'm focusing on the second book, both about the, the, the damage that war can cause, how it can ruin lives, how it can separate people, destroy dreams, displace people. And, you know, people can lose their identity. So war is ugly. It does not help humanity. It may help uh, a few political people for uh, proving whether they are right or wrong, but it's better to be kind and it's better to support and be pro-life. And so war does not help you at all on that front. And secondly, adoption. That's another very um, a close subject to my heart. And in my book, the most important part is respect for nature. 
because if you don't respect nature, she is going to avenge herself to make mankind reform themselves. So I presume now you're working on book three of your trilogy? Yes, yes. I just started it. <laughs> and it's a tough one because, you know, when you're writing a trilogy, you have to get all the links in together. So, you know, the audience doesn't lose its focus. None of the characters are neglected. You know, everything has to be put together. So right now I've got all these post-its with all my characters and who did what in which book. And are they going to meet again in the third book? So that's where I'm. I'm at the, at the initial phase of my book. Yeah, or organizing a book, especially in a trilogy, is, is really important. So did you set out to do a trilogy when you first started writing, or did that kind of evolve? Actually, I, I'm a keen believer of taking on the most difficult task first. <laughs> So I said that it's, uh, I don't want to do my poems first. That was the easiest to do. That's the third book, which is coming out in July. It's, it's a collection of poetry. And that's something I could have done in the beginning two years ago. But I said, no, I don't want to do that. I want to start with my trilogy. I want to develop it. And I want to make it a goal to take it to the end and to the end that the audience likes it. And because the first book became a bestseller and everybody loved it, it gave me uh, both uh, the motivation as well as the confidence to do the second one. And now I hope they love the second one. So then I think I'm going to be in seventh heaven to complete the third. Well, that's great. Your first book becomes a bestseller. That's that's <laughs> unique and really special. That's because I'm an Indian and our population is so big, you know. So for a first time writer, if you have uh, 7,000, 8,000 books that go out, you know, you automatically come in a significant category, which will not happen in countries like Turkey, where the population is much lesser or other smaller countries. That's, that's an interesting point. So let's get into a, a little bit one of your other passions, India Heart. Tell me about yes. that organization. So I, as, I um, as you know, my profile on LinkedIn, I've done more than 25 years of corporate life together, but I was actively for two decades in the corporate world. And then I took a sabbatical and I wanted to pursue my personal CSR because while I was working in the corporate world, I was associated with a lot of NGOs that worked with children. One of them is Magic Bus that, you know, works with street children in Mumbai. And, you know, they give them confidence. They teach them a sport. They help them with education and so on and so forth. So my, I wanted to do my personal CSR part. The personal CSR part was to talk and help women who don't have a voice. So India Heart was exclusively for rural women. You know, in India, they create beautiful handwork made with threads, glasswork, all those vibrant dresses that you see, those fabrics that you see, is created in these states by rural women. It is then purchased by a distributor or a trader who then sells it 10 times the price. So, you know, the, the woman who's got the talent is getting only one tenth of that, if not one twentieth. You know, she's not getting anything. Secondly, she's not even taught about which are the dyes that she's using, which can damage her health. And, you know, she has no level of computer literacy. So what, we, what I wanted to achieve with that uh, uh, initiative was to give 25% of my proceeds back. So we created dresses out of that, handbags of those fabrics, earrings for girls, fashionable, you know, urban girls who could buy those products. And 25% of that proceeds went back to get, teach them a bit about computer literacy so they understand a little bit of that and how to you know, keep a register of what you're selling and how much people owe you uh, to understand which of the dyes that they are using can damage their health in long term. And also to understand fair wage. That this is a product that in cities is selling at this price. So you shouldn't be selling your product one tenth or one twentieth that price. So that's what India Heart was all about. That sounds like a really worthy cause. Congratulations yes, on that. Thank so, you. It was rewarding. Yeah, thank you. Let's, uh, let's give you a chance to read an, an excerpt from, from one of your books. Give, give okay. the viewers a little treat here. Okay, great. I'm, go I'm, going to, I'm going to be biased here and read a poem. So this poem is from my second book, Child of Two Worlds. It's called Spring. Is it summer, restless and burning like a thirsty lover? Is it autumn, stripped of vanity, singing a hymn? 
Is it winter, frozen and wounded by some old splinter? Or is it spring, new dreams, words, experiences waiting to begin? What is in your heart, my love? Are you restless and burning still? Or stripped of vanity, do you stand upon love's hill? Or are you frozen and hurting still? For in my heart, it is always spring. Each day, every day since I met you is an endless spring. Very nice, very nice. I, I love how you, you weave your poetry throughout your books. It's, it's fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Anne. I really appreciate your time. I'm going to post links once again to, to your work underneath this video. Uh, please, everybody, subscribe to uh, uh, our Patreon account and uh, watch the, all of our, our videos on YouTube. Thank you so much, Anne De Silva. Thank you so much, Ted. I am so touched by your light and your energy. Your, your energy is so beautiful. It makes me smile. We've had this wonderful conversation even before we started the session. I really appreciate this. Thank you so much. Love and light to you. God bless. Oh, oh same to you. Thank you so much. Yeah, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye. Take care.